the program tries to identify some of our uh, top students. Uh, and we're looking for students who are doing interesting research, uh, who are excellent students, and who have demonstrated ability to communicate what they're doing to general audiences. And uh, we use them as ambassadors. Uh, we bring them to events, or at least back when we had events in person, <laughs> we would bring deans, research scholars to some of our events with alumni uh, to talk about uh, their research, and also to have Q&A about um, what they're doing, um, what their experience is like at MSU, uh, and just about anything else. Uh, so what we're going to do here is, uh, in a minute, I'm going to ask each of the scholars who are with us to introduce themselves, uh, talk, talk about you know, who they're working with, uh, and say, uh, maybe talk for a little about, about a minute about the research. Uh, this time around, I'm not insisting they use 10 words or less. <laughs> um, while they're talking about their interests and what they do, I'd like the rest of the audience to be thinking about questions they'd like to ask, things they want to know more about. Um, so first, before I introduce them, I'm going to ask if you figured out how to raise your hand uh, on Zoom, please raise your hand. Okay, I see 10, 20, 30. Uh, okay, so a lot of you have figured out how to raise your hand. That's good. So one way you can ask questions is to raise your hand, and I can see hands raised up on my screen over here, and I can call on you and give you the ability to speak. But another way to ask questions is through the Q&A feature of Zoom. And uh, there, you can just type your question in uh, whenever you want to, and I'll see the questions come up on my screen. And when you type a question in, uh, you can name the person you'd like to answer the question, or maybe it will just be a question that you'd like each of the students to uh, respond to. Um, you, can, you can let me know about that through the Q&A feature. Um, uh, I, I still see a few hands up. Uh, I'm going to ask you to lower your hands. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I'm not distracted. And uh, I will now call on uh, our, our uh, Dean's Research Scholars to uh, introduce themselves. So we'll start with Elena. Um, hi, my name is Elena, and I'm now a senior here at MSU. Um, I'm a zoology major, and I have a minor in public policy. And my research looks at um, specifically how gender plays a role in urban wild meat trafficking. So it kind of relates a lot to what's going on with COVID-19, um, more so now than it had previously. And broadly, I have an interest in conservation terminology, which is taking um, conservation and natural resource policy and criminal justice and kind of meshing it all together. Okay. Well, Elena, you were um, muted all of a sudden. Oh, I was done. I, I thought oh. I finished. <laughs> all right. Um, and I'll, I'll ask Cade to introduce himself. Hey everyone, my name is Kate Densky. I'm a sophomore here at Michigan State, majoring in physics and clarinet performance, uh, and I work at the laboratory on campus. Um, I develop machine learning algorithms for data analysis purposes. Um, so I kind of lie at the intersection of computer science and nuclear physics, uh, at least at the moment. So the motivation for that is um, in our uh, gamma ray uh, de uh, radioactive decay experiments, we get a lot of um, outside sources of noise in our data, like uh, background radiation from the environment and things like that. Uh, and the idea behind my project is that we can uh, use artificial intelligence techniques to remove a lot of these uh, barriers to data analysis um, and make our turnaround after the experiments uh, much quicker. Okay, thank you. Uh, Emily Stefke. Hi, I'm Emily. I am a um, graduating, should have been today, senior um, with degrees in neuroscience and English. Um, I have done research on campus in neuroscience on um, stress and anxiety, um, but this past year at Michigan State, I've been working on um, cancer immunology research, um, investigating how tumor cells can escape 
um, detection and destruction by your immune cells um, to help inform how we could better improve immunotherapies to target and kill cancer cells in the body. And um, building off of those experiences, I will be uh, beginning my PhD at Oxford in the fall, where I will be investigating the development of brain cancer vaccines, which basically is um, figuring out how to expose the body to um, the specific parts of a tumor that the immune system can recognize um, outside of the brain to help drive up an immune response against a patient's own brain tumor. Uh, Brent. Hi everyone, my name is Brent. I'm a junior, well, probably now a senior at Michigan State. My major is physiology and I'm doing a minor in public health and epidemiology. And while I've been on campus, I've actually been involved in research um, with uh, Dr. Matthew Reeves over at the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. And we've been mainly studying stroke, specifically um, treatments for stroke. So I've done a lot of work with a drug called tissue plasminogen activator that helps restore blood flow to the brain after a stroke and the treatment of women with that drug. I've also done research related to different drug combinations to help prevent a second stroke after somebody has a first stroke because they're typically at very high risk after that very first stroke event. And then I've also done some, some research related to how different clinical studies are conducted and issues of bias that might arise uh, when different things occur. And then most recently, actually, I've been involved in COVID-19 research at uh, Henry Ford Hospital looking at um, how COVID-19 attacks the kidneys and um, causes, causes acute kidney failure. So I've been involved in sort of those two different projects. Uh, Amanda? Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Amanda. I'm a graduating senior, so I'll be graduating tomorrow um, with a degree in human biology. And next year, I will be attending medical school at the College of Human Medicine at Michigan State. Um, and my research analyzes how family mealtime impacts childhood health outcomes. So I want you to think back to your family mealtime when maybe you were a kid or when you were raising kids. A lot happened at that family mealtime, I'm sure of it. So our goal is to analyze how those interactions at family mealtime impact childhood health, such as does that child develop obesity, um, blood glucose problems, and all sorts of other issues. Okay, and Don. Don, please unmute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, perfect. Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Um, my name's Don. I just finished my last final yesterday, so uh, officially done. Um, I work in Dr. Mendoza's laboratory in the biomedical laboratory diagnostics program, and mostly we look at pathogen, pathogen epidemiology. Um, I'm hoping to get a publication soon, like, but the whole situ current situation has put a hiatus on research that's considered uh, non-essential, basically nothing that's not COVID. So uh, we're waiting on that, but um, yeah, so I've just been uh, relaxing and enjoying my time since then. Uh, I'm a microbiology major, so uh, everything that's going on is very related to uh, what my experiences are. So very interesting outlook. Okay, uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you all a hand. There, there you go. Um, now it, I'm opening the floor to questions from the group. Um, and uh, I, 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 right now, I, I want to encourage people to just type in any question that occurs to them into the Q&A box. And uh, I'm going to ask the group, you know, what, one of the questions <laughs> on my list is, um, yeah, of everything you've experienced at Michigan State, what has surprised you the most? I'm asking each of you. What was surprises the most with uh, like anything? Yeah, what comes to mind? Um, well, I guess I could start. Is that okay? Yeah, um, go ahead. So what I first comes to my mind is uh, how a community comes from like such a big university because I remember when I first came to MSU you know you see the numbers it's like 50,000 students you have tons of opportunities you could do like you don't know where to start and what like you know where to make friends where to find a home like where to 
with the research lab to join or something like that. So uh, now that I'm graduating, like I can say very confidently, I know some of my professors, some of my mentors and teachers very well. And so uh, it's crazy to me to see four years ago that I would like, like miss this place so much with some people who I know I'm going to keep in contact with through social media, um, other things like that. And so um, have, finding that home in such a big university has been very nice and I did not expect that. Okay, thank you. Emily was the next to have her hand up. Yeah, going off of that, I, my uh, first thought is very similar that the biggest thing that surprised me was um, how often you like run into people you know on campus every single day and how small it begins to feel. It didn't really take long for um, me to feel like there were just like people all over the place who were really like looking out for me and um, there's nothing better than like biking around campus and running into one of your friends um, and getting tied up in a conversation or even just like shouting hi and passing. Um, I think that like I never expected MSU to feel so close and small, but uh, one thing I'm really going to miss is how there are actually so many familiar, friendly faces everywhere. Okay. And then uh, Cade had his hand up. Yeah, very similarly. Um, I uh, grew up in East Lansing, um, so I know many people here. Uh, lots of people <laughs> I went to high school with are here. Uh, lots of people who I've known since I was a kid on campus. Uh, so it, it really is such simultaneously a big campus and a small campus. Uh, I walk around and I look at uh, various buildings that I've never gone in, maybe never will go in, like uh, the Comarts building is massive and I've never even seen the inside of it. Um, but I know people, uh, for example, in the clarinet studio last year, there was a, a double major in computer science who happened to be working on a final project with one of my best friends from high school and I don't even remember how I figured it out. I think I was talking to him at lunch or something like that, but I thought it was so funny that they just happen to be in contact with each other, uh, despite the astronomical odds with everyone on campus. All right, thanks. Uh, Brent is next. Yeah, I think the thing that most surprised me was related to research because I came in expecting to go to medical school and thinking that research was sort of a chore to do in order to bolster my application to medical school. I think what I found is how much I've enjoyed that thrill of discovery, being involved in research, being able to make a contribution. I think that's partly true to how great my research mentor is, but just the general experience of research at MSU, I think has been absolutely amazing. That might have been my favorite part of my entire time there. And I was, I was pretty shocked to find it that scene as I thought it would it'd be more onerous than anything. All right, cool. And Amanda? I think I found what I found most surprising is all the opportunities that were made available to me as an undergrad. I would have never expected to be to see half the success that I've seen at MSU, but I was able to achieve most of that success thanks to programs such as the Dean's Research Scholars or the Charles Drew Science Scholar Program or all of the opportunities that they have for Native American students on campus. So I've been really impressed with all the things that MSU has been able to offer me as a student. Okay. Um, all right, uh, I, have, I have a bunch of written questions and some just uh, saying everyone is doing great research um, and on this list, uh, the next question is for Emily. Uh, what strategies do cancer cells employ to avoid detection? Sure, so um, I think it's really fascinating um, how immune cells or how cancer cells can kind of corrupt immune cells to get them on their side rather than biting them. So cancer cells, by definition, are cells that have multiple dysregulations going on that are allowing them to proliferate out of control. But to be allowed to proliferate out of control, they also simultaneously have other like mutations and deregulations that allow them to escape from the immune system. Some things that um, are included in this are that tumor cells can actually secrete factors called cytokines that can make it um, easier and um, recruit T regulatory cells that 
suppress the activity of the T cells that would be fighting cancer. So you have different classes of T cells. Um, your cytotoxic T cells are the ones that are going to like punch holes in bad cells and um, stuff them with enzymes that are going to like kill those cells. But of course, the body can't let T cells just like go out of control. Um, and so you have T regulatory cells that are um, in charge of making sure that those cytotoxic T cells are only taking those actions when really appropriate. Well, what tumor cells can do is secrete factors that turn those T regulatory cells on even though they shouldn't be on. And so those T regulatory cells suppress the activity of those cytotoxic T cells. Another way that cancer cells can escape um, the immune system is by down-regulating um, presentation of particles that allow um, cancer cells or that allow immune cells to recognize them. So um, you may have heard of like antigens. Antigens are um, recognizable molecules that um, the immune system can detect and say, oh, this antigen is like a viral antigen or a bacterial antigen or a tumor antigen, and I should kill that cell. However, um, that has to be presented on the outside of that cancer cell for the T cell to attack it. And normally, um, there are these molecules called MHC molecules that present those antigens to T cells. But cancer cells have figured out ways to stop expressing MHC molecules, so they're kind of invisible, incognito to the immune system, and the immune system can't attack those cells. There are uh, other mechanisms too, but I'll stop there. <laughs> I'd like to thank Emily for, uh, I, I, I've been reading a lot about cytokine storms lately, and I've been pronouncing it wrong in my head, so thank, thank you for the instruction. And, and Kate, thank you for introducing us to your cat. I've met many cats over the last month on Zoom. So so thank you. He knows. He knows whenever I'm on a call. It's it's eerie. It only it? comes it's up eerie. when I'm doing something. Okay. Um, here's a, a question that was uh, addressed to the group. Um, first, congratulations to the graduates, uh, all doing interesting work. Um, what ways have you found to communicate your findings to lay audiences and policymakers? And so, as usual, I'll ask you to raise your hand if you uh, wish to uh, address that question. What does it take to communicate your findings? Uh, Cade. Um, so, one thing I noticed about nuclear physics when I came in is it's incredibly jargon heavy. <laughs> there are many different terms that mean many different things that it's kind of, they're thrown around like to know them. Um, for example, the term multiplicity confused me when I came in, and so I Googled it. And there was, Google gave me a mathematical definition of multiplicity and a quantum chemistry definition. And I figured it was one of those. Turns out uh, there are two separate definitions of multiplicity just in the nuclear physics community uh, that mean slightly different things. You have to figure out which it is based on who you're talking to. But um, so you, you kind of have to avoid those pitfalls. Um, uh, that even though at first it's confusing, you, you sort of add these words to your lexicon one by one uh, and you integrate them into your speech about your research. Um, so one of the best ways I've found to avoid that is just to use examples. So one, one that I do a lot uh, as I do machine learning is image classification with a cat and a dog. If you, if you give your program a picture of a cat and a picture of a dog, you want it to be able to sort the two separately uh, into their uh, respective categories. Um, so yeah, example-based um, example presentation is, a, uh, I think, a really good way to communicate to lay audiences. Okay, yeah, and I find it very humorous that the term multiplicity has multiple definitions. Yeah. Uh, Brent. Yeah, I think probably one of the best ways that I've found is just attending scientific conferences, maybe not for lay people so much, but for policymakers, because a lot of the people who set um, clinical guidelines in the medical research, I do attend those conferences. So I had the opportunity this past February, thankfully right before the COVID pandemic really ramped up, to go to LA and present some of my findings um, to people who are formulating clinical guidelines specifically about the enrollment of women in these clinical studies, and that's important because um, the degree to which women are enrolled affects the generalizability to different populations. 
So that was an excellent opportunity presenting those findings in LA. And then I've actually had the opportunity recently with one of the researchers I met and then in LA and then one of my, with my boss as well to actually kind of participate in the policy making side. I actually helped um, format these clinical guidelines, formulate these clinical guidelines for treatment post-stroke to help prevent a second stroke as I was talking about. But I think, but I think that's definitely one of the main opportunities is attending conferences and uh, meeting other researchers. Okay, uh, Emily? Is Emily, can you hear me? E Emily, are you on? All right. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think that, um, well, this is especially the English major in me, um, I think that it's really important to be able to frame your science in terms of a story that follows a kind of cohesive narrative with like an exposition and a question and then kind of an ending. Um, and I think that going along with that, phrasing things in terms of characters can be really helpful. So um, sometimes when I talk about uh, how the immune system and cancer interact, it can be helpful to think about um, the immune system as like this super secret agent spy agency that's like trying to attack cancer cells that like are simultaneously fighting back and um, kind of just like capturing people's imagination about um, ways that as Cade said, like very esoteric terms in science can be applicable to things that are familiar with people in everyday life is really important. Okay, um, and, and if, yeah, if you can lower your hands if you're, you're done. Um, there's a question here for uh, Elena. Um, the, the, the question asker wants you to elaborate more on what your research involves. For sure. Um, my research is within the field of conservation criminology, and it's kind of a rising field that's combining um, wildlife conservation and natural resource policy with criminal justice. And it's basically functioning on this risk and decision component of wildlife crime. Um, because a lot of the people who are committing wildlife crime, they don't want to be committing it, but they're doing it out of necessity. And that's kind of where my research is at. Um, my research takes place in the Republic of Congo, specifically in Brazzaville, and with increasing rates of urbanization and human wildlife interaction, there's a huge shift from urban like wild meat markets going into like these urban environments besides being in like the rural environment. And um, wild meat is traditionally coined as bush meat, but just for my own personal reasons, I refer to it as wild meat. Um, and what's interesting about the urban markets is that there's a very distinct um, kind of like gender component that hasn't been looked at by a lot of people. So what my research is doing is kind of identifying when does gender matter and when doesn't it? So are there certain products, like are there certain species where women are primarily handling it or men are primarily handling it? Are there places where women are sourcing their products from that men aren't? And what I hope to kind of do with this research is see if there is like a element of gender within this industry, which from our research we have found that there is, and then kind of use that to influence um, policies or protections for these species and also kind of curb like employment opportunities within these areas to stop the trade essentially. Okay, uh, the next question is for Amanda. In your research, how do you factor in additional variables such as socioeconomic status, blended families, et cetera, in addition to just the physical interactions at mealtimes? Yeah, so that's a great question. Actually, our research focuses on um, low income and minority families in Michigan because we already know that um, family mealtime plays a role in childhood health, childhood health outcomes. And we know that um, low income and minority children are at risk for health disparities, such as they're more likely to get asthma or they're more likely to develop diabetes or obesity. So what our research aims to do is to inform policy in Michigan to provide, help provide families healthy meal educations and other resources. Okay. Um, this next question I, I believe is for Emily um, and uh, you're gonna have to help um, 
translate it for some of the lay people. <laughs> okay, have you considered collaborating with the CAR T cell folks? They are very excited about antigen escape in various malignancies and eventually brain tumors. Sure, so um, I can start by explaining what CAR T cells are. CAR T cells are um, artificially modified T cells that can specifically attack tumor cells. So the way that, um, and, and CAR T cells have been shown to be therapeutic in a variety of other cancers. They're FDA approved to treat um, things like melanoma, for example, and they're are currently clinical trials going on um, with CAR T cells and brain cancer. And so what, what, what they do is they um, take a patient's own T cells out of their bloodstream and they isolate them. And then um, like in a Petri dish, they can re-engineer those T cells to specifically drive them to a particular cancer antigen. So, um, this is being explored in the brain for a few different antigens. Um, and um, it's challenging in the brain because of like the blood brain barrier, um, making it difficult to traffic uh, T cells to the tumor sites, but it is definitely possible. Um, I have just finished like writing a paper for one of my classes about how uh, like the um, blood brain barrier changes uh, during disease states like cancer to be more permeable to cells of the immune system. Um, and so in terms of collaborating um, with vaccination strategies and CAR T cell strategies, um, it's definitely something that is being looked into. Um, one of the, one of the biggest things that we've started realizing in cancer immunotherapy in the past couple of years is that monotherapies, that is like giving one type of immunotherapy at once, is often much less effective than giving um, multi-therapies at once. So um, for example, in, in brain cancer especially, um, giving vaccines, which can boost a T-cell response, um, is not useful if those T-cells are being suppressed. Like I, like I mentioned before, like by T-regulatory cells um, or other cells that are turning those T-cells off. So there's another immunotherapy called checkpoint inhibitors, which um, are given to prevent the regulatory cells from being suppressing. Um, and so that can actually um, make uh, things like vaccines more efficacious. Um, and in terms of combining them directly with T cell, CAR T cell therapies, um, you um, could potentially have CAR T cells that were targeting one antigen. Well, that you had peptide vaccines um, or uh, tumor vaccines in general that were um, exposing the body to other antigens. So rather than just picking like one specific marker on the tumor that you're driving a response against, you could pick multiple, um, multiple antigens, multiple markers on the tumor, um, different cells within the tumor. Okay. So I have one for Don, this is kind of mold. Uh, any particular nasty bug that you have found particular to the eyewash, which is why you chose to study biofilm on the eyewash, and are any special microbial hiding places you have found on the station? And unmute. So uh, there's, it's actually really interesting because when we like, when I was doing this uh, project, it was like two years basically like culturing like hundreds of different strains because these eye washers when when i was like uh when we were culturing these eye washers like people forget there's millions of different bacteria and you know fungi and whatever else on there and so we had to differentiate all of them which means that we need media to grow fungi and then media to grow bacteria and media to grow there's viruses on there so like we had to do a, i do a lot of research a lot of reading on what we had to purchase and buy and stuff like that and so i spent like months just preparing the stuff to grow them in the lab and then to replicate those conditions. And then after that, we, we were able to sequence them and we found a lot of uh, like there were these uh, cocci 
specific cocci, lactobacillus, lactobacillus species that were really like uh, infectious towards people that are immunocompromised. And so that's a worry because if uh, these eye washers, you're literally spraying this into your eyes, which is a very like uh, easy place to enter the human body. And so um, having like these bacteria that can uh, infect you, you don't want that in your eye washers, obviously. And so we're lucky that like certain uh, policies already in place that pr like that protects people from having to use eye washers in the first place, like wearing safety goggles. And there's also like, if you go to like, any lab or any teaching uh, place, they'll be very uh, strict on lab rules on like in terms of wearing gloves, not touching your eyes and stuff like that. And so like, we're lucky that we don't have to use eye washers very much in the first place. Um, like when we did surveys, only like two labs had used the eye washers in the past like five years. So um, we're like MSU for that is very safe. Um, and so there's like a lot of training done too. Um, but it's very interesting to see that uh, like all the stuff that grows, like where like things that you don't think about. And just because it's like, it's a very moist environment, there's a lot of water there. Uh, and so even when you clean it, that was a thing. Like even when you clean it, like these, biofilms are super resistant against like these cleaning supplies. And that's why like they're able to grow like that. Like even if you use disinfectants, like they, the biofilm forms protective layer around these bacteria. And then basically, yeah, it's like basically a, like a, uh, like a complex that protects them from these toxic chemicals. So, uh, yeah, I guess you're trying to kill the things that has survived all the previous attacks. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's a question, uh, and this is for the group. Has the shift to online learning had any adverse impact to your research? How do you work around activities that can't be done remotely like lab experiments? Who would like to go first? Kate. Yeah, so uh, I'm in a somewhat interesting position uh, where I'm the only um, student working on my project at the moment for my group. So, I don't really have to go into the lab and physically be present to work on it, particularly because it's uh, very programming based. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, this hasn't really affected my research patterns all that much. Uh, you know, my meetings are now on Zoom instead of at the lab, of course. And, um, but also some extra stuff that I was going to be doing. Like uh, I was gonna be going to the Argon Lab uh, in Chicago uh, this summer to help out with some experiments that were going on down there. That's all shelved for now. Um, so I think uh, the switch has affected a lot of different research in different ways. Okay, uh, next person to have their hand up was Emily. Yeah, so I um, have, pretty much come to a standstill with my research, unfortunately. Um, I was in the process of doing a lot of French top wet lab experiments. And so um, those have all just kind of been put on hold. And um, I have been able to do some reading and help um, my PI with revising a grant proposal, but um, it's it's kind of weird to be ending my research career on this note because, uh, well, at Michigan State, I should say, um, because, you know, I was really hoping to kind of wrap up some of these experiments that I've been working on and planning on um, for a long time. And so now that will not happen. Um, so that's, that's pretty disappointing and unfortunate, but uh, it is what it is. Okay, uh, Amanda. So I'm in a similar situation to Cade where I'm actually able to code remotely. So my research is um, we watch recorded videos that families uh, send in through their iPod, iPad that we give them um, and it all gets uploaded to our database. And so we have months of these families eating dinner and so my job is to go in and watch those videos and code those interactions and I watch for certain interactions such as hostility, um, whether or not the child is compliant or defiant, um, whether or not the parents are intrusive and failing meal time. So that's all able to be done from home. However, it is a little bit tricky because I'm not able to go into the computer lab and I just have my little laptop that I'm coding on. So it takes a lot longer and um, the access to the files through MSU, I'm all the way up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So it takes a little bit to load. So it is 
slowing down the research, but it's still going. Okay. Uh, Brent. Yeah, I'm in sort of a similar position as Amanda and Caden that I can do a lot of it remotely. One of the things we're very fortunate is that um, one of this big research projects, this clinical study that my um, PI was leading was wrapped up um, about a year ago. And then we're, we're currently in the process of analyzing data for secondary outcomes um, for that study. It would have been a complete disaster if COVID-19 had struck in the middle of the study because it, it relied on interactions between stroke patients and social workers to help improve long-term outcomes. So obviously it would have been completely in the tank if COVID-19 had struck at that, at that time. So luckily I'm, I'm in the spot where I can, I can work on a lot of the data analysis remotely, which is great. And I am working with Henry Ford Hospital as well, which is kind of weird because I can't really go in. So I'm working with a pathologist there who does a lot of the autopsies and biopsies for COVID-19 patients. So he just has to sort of send me these, these images. I can't actually go in because of the risk of infection. So, but I mean, it's been, it's been somewhat annoying, but I think there's been a lot of ways to work around it, which has been nice, at least for my research. Okay, and, and before we get to Don, I, there, there's a kind of a closely related follow-up question, <laughs> which is, uh, are you at liberty to elaborate on the current research you're involved at in Henry Ford on COVID-19? Yeah, absolutely, um, without a doubt. So um, I'm working with a pathologist there, uh, his name is Adrian Ormsby, and he's done, he's, as I said, he's responsible for a lot of the biopsies, so these tissue samples they're taking from COVID-19 patients. And one of the really interesting things is, and as we know, um, SARS-CoV-2, the name of the coronavirus, it, it attacks the, the, the respiratory system, it attacks the lungs, it causes difficulty breathing. But then there's some evidence coming out that there's a variety of effects in other organs, like the brain. There's some reports published in the New England Journal of Medicine showing strokes happening in very young patients. Um, there's some other reports of patients experiencing renal failure, kidney failure. So what we're doing is we're looking at um, a couple of patients who have taken tissue biopsies from. And what these tissue biopsies, these tissue samples imaging is showing that there's um, serious destruction, extensive damage to a part of the kidney called the proximal tubule, which is responsible for a lot of the different reabsorption of things like glucose and sodium. Um, there's a loss of protein into the urine. There's destruction of the different structures that help prevent protein from being lost into the urine. So we're seeing some interesting findings about how, how um, COVID-19 is actually affecting other organs outside of the lungs. Okay, and then to Don. So, uh, like a lot of uh, research that requires like lab time, um, you're just unable to do it at the moment. Uh, so, uh, and that makes it hard because I like those experiments of that I was working on. Like, I just have to hold off on them. And so, my my PI actually emailed me just yesterday about how like he's waiting until June, see what happens. Um, and so, hopefully, I'll be here around then and. If like things get cleared up, then I can come back in lab and um, work on the publication we're trying to get out. But uh, what's nice is when you have like data, it's very easy to just work with it all like on a computer. Uh, the only thing you just can't do is get like get more data. So if you already have data, it's very nice to use that and like kind of work with it. But uh, it's hard when you have no lab experience. And ITA like a uh, a lab class and and like when this happened in like March, like the class basically ended. Like there's nothing you could really do. So it was really like a, like a kind of like a weird um, unorthodox thing I experienced there. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure uh, how that, like the college will work around um, those labs that just kind of like half, uh, half finished. But um, hopefully those students can find a way to get that experience they need. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm tempted to ask Elena, as, as a zoologist, what attracts cats to Zoom sessions? But maybe that's completely unknown. <laughs> I don't know. She, um, you know, like a real answer, she just likes seeing things move, I think. It's, I see. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's a phenomenon I've observed, so, so I was curious. Um, next question is for Emily. Uh, the brain tumor vaccines you'll be working on in the future, are they designed to be given to healthy people to prevent the development of brain cancer as a treatment option to stimulate the immune response in patients with early stage cancer? Yeah, so they are going to be designed to be given to patients who already have brain cancer um, as a treatment option, not necessarily only early phase um 
there are other um, versions of uh, vaccines that are being tested even in people with recurrent um, glioblastoma, for example. But the idea really is that um, brain, so for T cells to be activated to go and be dispatched out to go fight against a tumor cell, they have to be exposed to the antigen and they have to be activated. And so you can think of the lymph nodes as sort of like a headquarters of the immune system. Um, normally all of your antigens are going to like drain into the lymph node headquarters. And then um, the T cells are going to be like waiting there um, for their instructions. Instructions. And once they're exposed to those instructions, they can go off to wherever the um, tumor is and go fight it. Um, for brain cancer, there is some drainage of um, antigens from your brain um, through some pathways, including like directly through like your nasal plate um, into those lymph nodes. But in general, um, the amount of brain antigens that get to the lymph node headquarters are a lot less than um, in the rest of your body where everything's kind of a lot more like free floating, you could think of it as. Um, and so the um, idea behind having a vaccine is that you make these antigens that are all kind of stuck up in the brain widely available. Um, and those, those vaccines can be picked up trafficked to the lymph node headquarters, T cells can then be activated and go out to um, target brain cancer cells. Okay. Next question is for Amanda. How did you come to be interested in family mealtimes? Yeah, so I've always wanted to be a pediatrician. Um, so that's one of my goals. And so I was interested in how um, the different aspects in childhood health. So the social aspects like family mealtime contributes to health, in my opinion, um, where you have yet to find out in what ways, but um, I wanted to be able to analyze those aspects of health in a way that my hard, hard science curriculum did not allow. Um, I'm also super interested in health disparities. As a Native American, I also want to practice um, at my tribal clinic, and it's known that um, Native American people suffer from the worst health disparities out of any ethnic group in the United States. So I think family mealtime plays a role in health, and I want to learn how we can lessen health disparities in the U.S. Okay. Um, the next question is about uh, how you're supported through information technology at Michigan State. Um, what is the best and worst thing uh, you've experienced regarding information technology at Michigan State? Kate. Well, I'm happy to take this one because I have access to three or four um, high performance computing clusters here at Michigan State. So I've gone through the IT department who knows how many times now. Um, the, the development of these machine learning algorithms is an incredibly process to a lot of mathematical operations that go into developing the structure. So I have um, access, as I said, to about four, three different um, CPU clusters uh, that are very, um, very powerful, very good for this kind of stuff. And they all have different, um, slightly different uh, nuances to them. They have different coding, um, not necessarily languages, but they, they interact uh, via bash some, somewhat differently. Um, and they have, uh, they keep things in different places. You have to memorize different directories and things like that. So it's uh, the access to all the computational resources has kind of been the best thing and the worst thing for me because it's great to have all of this available um, and have an IT department there to help you. But it's also, um, you know, having to keep all of the different systems straight and, uh, you know, getting access to all of them on various different accounts um, uh, to access your data and uh, computing resources and things like that has been a long process. All right. Uh, I have a question for Elena, Amanda, and Emily. As a woman in STEM, have you felt supported and in what ways? What would you say to other young women about entering STEM fields? Um, All right, Emily. 
I, I can start. Um, I have honestly felt nothing but supported. Um, I uh, worked with a female PI, Michelle Maisie Robinson, um, for the majority of my time at MSU. And I think she was a really great role model for me, um, just in terms of like somebody who uh, was juggling like having a family and um, like also being a really um, like influential woman in science. Um, I'm excited to also be working with a female supervisor for my PhD. Um, I think, um, I don't know, it's, it's like nice to see that um, women are um, getting more and more into leadership roles in science. I, I mean, the majority of um, principal investigators I've worked for in like summer internships and stuff have been men, um, but I think that there are a lot of really, really great women at Michigan State who are doing amazing science. Um, Aaron Purcell in um, engineering and neuroscience um, was also uh, really an inspiring role model for me. Um, I took a class with her and we had a number of really good conversations about um, kind of what being a woman in science looks like in kind of practical life. And um, so I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And um, I would say that the biggest thing that I would advise um, young women going into science um, to do is to find a uh, role model, um, somebody who you feel comfortable um, talking with. Um, because sometimes it really can feel like, man, I'm looking around and I'm the only woman here. But um, there's also uh, a lot of women who are doing amazing things and they like want to support each other. So, yeah. uh, Amanda. Yeah, so I had a similar experience to Emily. While I was at MSU, I received nothing but support, and my um, my PI is actually a really strong female and private investigator, and she is amazing, and she's a great role model for me to have. Um, but that hasn't always been the case for me. I grew up from a really small rural town in the Upper Peninsula, and science wasn't really on my radar. I didn't think that I could be a doctor or a scientist. I'm a first-generation gener college student, and um, so that kind of inspired me. One day I was driving back from one of my exams um, and I was like, wow, like look at all this opportunity that I've had and wouldn't it be great to go back to my hometown and to show middle school girls that were just like me a few years ago that they can be a science, scientist and they can do it. So I created a girls in science program in my um, small town. So it's a three day after school program that happens every year now and it's funded by the local middle schools and also receives donations from MSU, um, their biological science department. And I have been able to provide um, a lot of young middle school girls with um, future mentors and with the knowledge that they can be a scientist and that science is fun. Okay. Um, Elena. Yeah, so um, being at state, I've had a lot of support, but going further kind of within the conservation field, um, there aren't that many women of color or that many women in general. So kind of finding um, your village essentially and establishing that has been really important for me. So I have a lot of other female friends and friends of color who are also going into conservation because there's not that many of us like higher up essentially. And finding support within those networks has been really, really helpful for me within this field because there are times where it gets kind of tough. And I have a mentor, um, Meredith Gore, she's in fish, trees, and wildlife, and she also, similar to Emily and Amanda, has been incredibly influential on my career and who I am as a person. And I think um, for any young women who want to go into STEM or go into conservation, like, Finding a role model is really important, but also finding your village to kind of support you through this entire process is also important as well. Okay. Well, there's a question I've saved for last. We're, we're starting to close in on 1 p.m. And it, uh, there's a comment from someone and a question from someone else. Uh, the comment is really happy to hear that you're working to translate your work for lay audiences. This is so critical. Don't hesitate to make time in your careers to craft commentaries and blogs to do this translation. 
That's from one person. The second, the question from someone else is, in your opinion, do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic will strengthen or weaken public confidence in scientific research processes and policy recommendations? Now, clearly, we could take the rest of the afternoon <laughs> discussing this one, but I you know, would just like to hear your thoughts as people who are not just scientists, but have gotten out experience as ambassadors of science. And Don was the first to raise his hand. So I would say that um, I think now it's, it depends. I think it's definitely the influence of like, kind of like the media, you know, um, because the science has all been like, from what I've known, like it's been going well with what it has been like with, especially with like the now with development of vaccines, like they're actually cutting corners with developing the vaccines to try to get this vaccine out sooner because usually it takes like 10 years to develop a vaccine for a lot of diseases and they're trying to like push one out in within a year. So there's a lot of like risk that's going to be having to be taken because um, uh, you're having less clinical trials, you're having less time to see if there are side effects years down the road. So uh, there's a risk, but you have to weigh the outcomes, you know, like what's the risk versus reward. So uh, when you have a pandemic this big, like this global, uh, a lot of people say it's, it's uh, they need to spend a lot of money and a lot of time research going there. So I think like uh, what I've seen is like the influence of the media on how things get perceived. So it's like the media can make things look way more scary than they are. They can also make science look more distrustful and look more like, like it's trying to hide something when it's not. Um, because when you don't like understand the process, it looks like there's like fear. So it's like when someone says, you know, that this has a potential effect to cure, like this drug has a potential effect to cure COVID. And then people start testing the drug and it's not working. Like they're saying, oh, well, they lied about it in the first place. Well, the uh, hydrochloroquine, which was, I think uh, President Trump made a comment about that. Like it was effective against SARS back in 2006, but that was a different SARS than it is now. And so the co-receptors are different, everything's different. So like when you have to be careful making those comments because then you, have, you saw examples of people taking those substance, like taking those chemicals when they don't know what they are and then getting sick and having to go to the hospital. And so uh, like the media, I think the important job is the media to not like incite fear into people, like into people who are uh, into like the public because the science is getting done, like people are on top of it, but when you like scare people into being more fearful for something, like they start to do uh, uh, things that they shouldn't, so. Right. I'll give the last word on this to, to Brent. Yeah, I think initially at the beginning of the pandemic, I would probably say that it would have weakened trust in science. I think you see sort of an inadequate response, inadequate preparedness on the part of the scientific community for a major pandemic. Um, my boss talks about it a lot. Like there've been years of modeling preparation for an extensive pandemic specifically an influenza pandemic in the CDC. So I think it's sort of mind boggling that, that in many ways the scientific community was pretty ill prepared. But at the same time, I think you're seeing a lot of positive signs that might bolster trust in science. I mean, I heard recently that there's evidence of a positive effect of a new antiviral drug, remdesivir, I believe it's called. Um, they're working hard to develop vaccines. So there's all sorts of great research that's coming out um, showing ways that it can be treated, hypotheses for how um, COVID-19, you know, has its effects on the human body. So I think ultimately, despite the initial failings, I think the long-term response has been pretty good. And I think that will hopefully help restore any lost trust that was a result of uh, how damaging the pandemic has been. Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for um, yeah, coming through on a Dean's Research Scholar's event like no other. <laughs>